consider myself a Russian expert. I uh, think so. <laughs> I have a question for Bill. <clears throat> when I look at the world today, I see things getting warmer and the ice caps melting. And to me, that means that uh, Russia is no longer an isolated uh, a country. All it has to do is go north. And on the other side of the ocean, the Arctic Ocean, there's Europe and uh, Asia. And so you have lots of uh, trading partners there. Is there any discussion in Russia of taking advantage of climate change and uh, thinking of itself as uh, having a new ocean on the north side of the country. Maybe uh, Slava can answer that too. Bill is talking. Yeah, you're, you're uh, muted. I'm sorry, I was sorry. So Stuart, um, very good question, very critical. I am not up to speed on what's going on in Russia with respect to this in any manner, shape, or form, other than sort of at a high level. But I know that this is one of the issues that's the, the United States and Russia and China are all particularly concerned about what's happening with the Arctic. Arctic. So, in fact, yes, if we have, if it continues to have the level of melting going on and opens up regular access to the for the for the Arctic, it's going to be a game changer. Now, it could I think it's going to be a game changer in a sense of giving greater access, but it's also going to be a now a place for the increasing tensions and conflicts over who controls that. And even if there is relative agreements about how to allocate access to different parts of the Arctic as, as this sort of global com, uh, as a global common, not just a, a, a geographic area that a few countries get access to, it's still going to take a long, long time to develop the supply chains and the interactions, et cetera. But yes, it will change. It'll be very significant because it'll be access to warm water, but it'll also do so in ways that currently, it's important to remember Russia's warm water access is in fact constrained. They're both, both of the places where it has warm water access are largely constrained by bottlenecks. Odessa, about, you got to go through the, the Dardanelles and you got to go to Gibraltar to get out to the rest of the world, to get to the Suez Canal. The same thing in terms of if they get back to having some warm water access that's in large volume on the Baltic, you still have a bottleneck going out there. The, the advantage of the uh, Arctic Ocean is that you don't have the same kind of bottlenecks. But uh, so I see rising opportunities but also rising tensions. Well, Stuart, do you mean that uh, once the North Pole is melt away and the Russians will take Canada immediately, <laughs> very easily, right? Canadians cannot defend themselves. I don't, I'm not thinking about um, uh, Canada. I, it's just, My understanding is that the ice cap on the North Pole is shrinking, that the mo freedom of movement across the Arctic Ocean is much greater than it has been in the past. The, the Arctic is melting faster than any other part of the planet. And if I were in charge of Russia, I'd be building ports on the Arctic and figuring out how to get out that way, building railroads to <laughs> go up to northern ports. Uh, you don't have much competition there. I mean, yeah, look I can Canada take, alone. take Canada. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> what does Slava think about this? Slava? Um, uh, thank you, uh, Stuart. I'm very glad to see you. Um, uh, in uh, my opinion, uh, Arctic is uh, very uh, important uh, for Russia and uh, for world countries uh, too. Uh, and uh, uh, we uh, should uh, exclude uh, militarization uh, of Arctic. Uh, we uh, should uh, not uh, repeat uh, mistakes of uh, Ukrainian uh, conflict. Uh, 
Um, as for uh, Russian uh, state uh, bodies, uh, we have uh, very good uh, possibilities uh, to uh, develop uh, Arctic uh, territories and uh, resources. Uh, and uh, Rosatom, uh, which is uh, highest uh, Russian uh, innovation uh, state corporation, uh, is uh, responsible now uh, for uh, development in uh, Arctic. Um, uh, Rosatom uh, has a uh, of uh, international, uh, international projects, uh, and uh, uh, I hope uh, uh, we, uh, we will, um, uh, we can uh, develop uh, Arctic uh, together. Gary, um, you raised your hand. I am optimist. Gary, you raised your hand before? No. No. <laughs> okay. Who has questions? Klaus, would you like to respond to the other two discussants? Well, unfortunately, I couldn't make, I, I had difficulties hearing. So I got only kind of the, the top lines um, uh, with the, with, uh, Bill, um, I mean, he he has a sympathetic picture of the of the Russian needs, but so have other countries. And if the Russian needs are at the expense of other countries, that is a problem for many other countries. That is one I think one to me one great accomplishment of the European countries that they abandon really the importance of the national identity. Not that they abandon it, but they respect each other and, and don't need to have any expansion of the, the boundary. If you look at the history, I, I mean, the, the, Russia was only less than half of the Soviet empire, and now it wants to regain the whole thing. And, and if you don't want to look at, at Germany, Germany was in Poland, in Russia was now Russia. And, <laughs> It would be laughable, at least for Germans, to say, or there were actually some people said, we want to gain this back and fight Russia to get Prussia back into German hands. But nobody wants to do that anymore. However, if you base your, your national identity on continuous expansion, like in the case of Ukraine, uh, or Russia in, in Ukraine, then you get into difficulties. There are people saying, why, and I fully agree with this, why don't we ask the, the Russia to join the European Union? I, 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 not, nothing would be better than that. However, you can't have a, a member of the European Union which is out to annex the other and, and, and fight this. So th there has to be some sort of a change in, in mental, what I would say mentality. And, and I think what I'm actually impressed by is uh, what happened in Europe, the European Union or the idea of, of being just European and not just Italian and, and, and uh, Norwegian, etc., but being together. And I think that is a very different kind of spirituality that is, I think is desirable. And I, I do think, um, uh, I mean, Ukraine wanted to be part of that, and in many ways was already. And when you ask people, why do you fight? I mean, like, I'm interested in, in why people join the military. Well, uh, during the Nazi period, there was an ideology, and they, if you wanted to ask that, they would get a, rep a statement of how important it is to free Germans from Polish domination. Uh, well, that is all ridiculous, but it's very abstract, and people fight for that. If you if you look for uh, actually, I mean, I have been looking into interviews uh, of of white people in Ukraine fight for for independence. Well, it is actually fighting for a way of life, 
not particular borders, but not particular uh, uh, domination, not, not dominating Russia, not punish them in some ways. And that's a very different attitude. And, it, and that's why I'm, I think um, that may be a little naive, and it certainly is, uh, to say that I think an, an important uh, element of change is to introduce information from different sizes, from different areas, and allow people to verify it. For example, if you, if you, uh, uh, I know, for example, I read from Russia, there are lots of the younger generation, when they see pictures of destruction from Ukraine, they get cold feet and they're opposing the war. And this is, that is a, one way of doing it, is to show what kind of terror one, one creates and saying, well, is that what you want? Is this what you, what you want to live for and want to do for others? And so I, I think we have a bit of a chance to the technology to increase the alternatives and let people make their own decision and particularly when they can verify it. Like pictures are not so easily uh, fabricated, even though that was always the case, that uh, like for Russian television or if you're German, <coughs> from German um, during the Second World War, uh, there were, for example, the same thing that, that Russia was doing. There, there, there were films made of Germans being uh, beaten up by Poles. It was all staged. You know, but you see the importance of the information that is provided. If you, if you provide things that can be verified, the way you can see, and I think I know several people from Ukraine in the United States that have both that are both Russian passports or have brothers in Russia, and it is so amazing how little they know of each other and appreciate, in fact, what, what the facts are. Jimmy. Yes, um, I, I I found it okay. Maybe let me start with 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 Klaus's presentation. I, I think the kernel of Klaus's presentation was uh, runaway positive feedback loops or Kismo genesis. This and how fascism, uh, in one of the slides that they say, uh, we can call it whatever we want, but the principle is, is a cybernetic principle. So you, you kind of appeal to an image of superiority, but for it to work, you need to have an other who, who must be demonized and treated as inferior. And then you use that dynamic uh, and you in a propaganda machine and eventually you will find some insecure people who, who actually buy it and go along with it. And there is a literature, uh, Mark Scheler wrote this book, uh, Schizmo uh, on um, Resentiment. Uh, where and, and it has been argued that that explained uh, World War II. But having said this, then, then Klaus, in your uh, picture was missing um, this, what the United States has been doing because the United States is also in some manner um, having its own propaganda war and its own propaganda and it's using the same principles of demonizing the other and um, and not appealing to whatever they can to uh, make people feel superior vis-a-vis -vis the other. And that has been definitely happening vis-a-vis -vis the <laughs> war in the Ukraine. And as Slava pointed out, if China puts rockets um, in uh, Puerto Rico and no, on Costa Rica, or uh, so, so the United States could not say, oh, that is normal uh, business as usual. The, 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 there would be immediately a question about what is China doing here? So, so there is, the, the picture is much more complicated, uh, I think, than just saying that there is a problem with uh, Russia. And, and Bill, I really appreciated um, the perspective that you gave, but I think, um, you also kind of created a little bit of one-sided picture of Russia, of like the declining <laughs> nation. I mean, you you reminded me. Uh, I mean, because you didn't really focus on. 
I mean, what is there that actually uh, people can be proud of? And, and we only can know that by actually engaging with them. And whatever people say about it, the fact that he has this nuclear arsenal shows that there are engineers, that there is a lot of important know-how. So I, I agree. Um, I 100% I agree that, that Stalinism is not something that we would want and, and that is a horrible history. Uh, it's something bad man's history. Uh, but, but I think as a cybernetician, I really would focus on the runaway positive feedback loop and what we can do uh, to stop that. And, and I think to stop that, we, we cannot just uh, have this dynamic of that there is, um, that there are only two. And I call that the binary, just this binary thinking and that it is important to, and I think that's where class was getting at the end, that we kind of really say, how can we stop that? And uh, as opposed to adding to the binary thinking. So that is <laughs> my feedback to the presentation. I want to emphasize one thing that also uh, came out, I think, the issue of abstractions. Now, abstractions are in the mind. Why do you fight for it? Why do you fight for uh, Russia or big or Ukraine? I think it's far more important to to live with your neighbor, and I think to, to be in you know enthused about the big abstractions against each other. And in fact, what what Margaret is pointing out, what I think is a general phenomena of all ideologies, I, all ideologies need to have an opposition and need to have an enemy. And once you buy into one, you create the enemies and you create fights. And these, but these are abstractions. And I think we should focus on what everyday life is bringing. And I think uh, if, you, if you look at, 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 as I said, you know, Europe is, is to me, it's amazing. Actually, I was just recently talking to someone who was from Nepal and is living in Europe and, and I asked you, well, what, what is your thing? I'm European. You know, well, that, this is a way of life to be able to travel, to do, do things and that doesn't require abstractions. And so I think that this is, a, this is the biggest danger to me is, is to follow abstractions that lead you into oppositions, into enemies, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I would, let me, Chime in just quickly on that. I agree. I want to make sure I'm very clear. My focus on this was taking a look at what I consider to be a really oppressive behavior on the part of Putin and Russia. That is an example of human autonomy and the conflicts between human autonomy, uh, individual systems seeking to run their own lives, do their own thing. I agree wholeheartedly with what Klaus said and, and uh, Margaret with respect to what would be the right kind, the, the best kind of world. But I also see significant um, compromises or at the at the international level, at the local level, uh, with rising authoritarianism. So you see the same behavior in Putin that you see in the Maganistas and the Trump in the United States and Chavez and others around the world, increasing efforts of of certain kinds of folks in certain kinds of places to go back to what has been the historical norm for humanity, which was, if I don't get my way, I'm going to hit you over the head until I do. And what there's been in the in the, especially in the West, and the West has been the driving force in the in, in terms of global changes, it towards more and more emphasis on exactly the kind of factors that that uh, Klaus is mentioning, uh, which is that we shouldn't be spending all our time fighting each other for over these big big questions. But how do we get along? How do I exercise my autonomy? To, do, to create the kind of world that I want to live, you know, I'm the boss of me. How do I do that in ways that does so in responsible to the greater good, in sense that I'm not compromising Klaus's autonomy and agency, or etc. And what you see is that there's, I see a return to, at at the geopolitical level, and this is an example. But you could have done the same analysis and the same points with respect to what's going on 
with with the extremism and the and the polarization and the vindictiveness within the United States uh, in terms of what's going on now. Same same behavior cybernetically, and again fundamentally, and I think this is the cybernetic imperative, is that how do you act in ways, I mean, go back to what I think it was Heinz said, how do you act in ways to increase your choices? I would say, how do you act in ways that increase the greater good without sacrificing your own good? In other words, we have to pay attention to the fact that there are human nature and a lot of human beings that basically say in order to get what they want, they're gonna compromise or limit other people's freedoms. So this is not acceptable. And it's not acceptable in all kinds of ways. And unfortunately, it's not just an intellectual effort. This is, this is there, there are real things happening. And I thought it was important to be able to at least share my perspective on that. Um, and, and so I wanna be very clear, to me, the real threat, the big issue I mean, I think there are two big issues in the Anthropocene. There are a whole lot of other issues, but the, the big one from the planet standpoint is global warming and climate change, very oppressive on the planet, ecologically, et cetera. And in the human domain, it's this oppression and authoritarianism, and it, it manifests itself in racism and you know, it interact, all other kinds of ways of doing it, but it's the oppression, the authoritarianism, the autocracy is unacceptable. and and we have to figure out how to do that. I, I'd make one other quick point, and I, I appreciate Klaus's, and I agree with Klaus's notion that what we should be trying to do is, is reach out to people and share facts and give them more information so that people can have a better sense of making sure what they do. That's fine when you're dealing with people who are open-minded or at least willing to engage and interact in a cybernetic way, in a sense of a conversation, not just an argument or a diatribe. But there's an awful lot of research that shows that the greater, the people who are more extreme are less interested and less open to facts. And one of the things that's been a frustration as a, a faculty member and a professor and an, an academic is to recognize that a lot of people don't pay attention to the facts. You can give them more information, more data. If they've already made up their minds, they believe a certain way, especially if they deeply believe a certain way, the ideology, political, religious, cultural, you pick all the different isms out there. They are, facts are not gonna change our minds. So the question is, is how do you regress, how do you resist forceful autonomy and aggression and oppression in ways that allow you to be able to see some hope for moving forward? So to me, again, I would be happy to give a, a similar talk, but I'd make some of the same points if we were taking a look at what's going on politically in the United States right now, because from a cybernetic standpoint, my view is they are identical. Car? Car? Car should no, have no, no, uh, no. important I, I, I would like to respond, if I can, very quickly uh, to, to Bill. <laughs> Uh, when you uh, said, uh, I'm going to follow high school first or act in a way that increases my choices, you, you actually modified it and, and you said to increase good choices and, and not uh, increase bad choices. And, and I think that this one needs to be had in the community of cybernetics, that, that there needs to be a discussion about that the different types of cybernetics. And, and Klaus and I have had a conversation about Margaret Mead versus Heinz von Furster. And, and that they actually have a slightly different view of cybernetics. And, and that, that, that there needs to be a little bit of discussion because uh, for instance, uh, and, and then I'm going to show that when you say facts, actually philosophy of science and Karl Popper, since Slava is here, has mentioned that over and over again, there are no facts, it, there are statements of facts. In the moment it's a statement, you actually bring in a theory about language. And so what I see the problem is, is that um, the academy has ignored some fundamental philosophy of science. And so what they present as facts, uh, there's actually a lot of other stuff that is coming together with it. And, and we need to be able to have a discussion about that. And I, again, I think cybernetics is the, is the community to do it because we really are looking at the consequences and the, the feedback loops that are okay. uh, coming from it. Okay, let's hear our own car. Car, 
You raised yes, your hand for a long time. Uh, thank you. I'd like to raise the question of the moral responsibility of a major actor in the Ukraine-Russian conflict, which we haven't really talked about, and that is the moral responsibility of the West, because the West is supporting the Ukraine in this struggle against Russia, which on the one hand sounds very noble, on the other hand, it's leading to the destruction of the Ukraine and death of uh, hundreds of thousands, I suppose, or many thousands of, of Ukrainians and Ukrainian millions of Ukrainian refugees. The reality of the situation is that Russia is going to maintain and uh, perhaps expand its control of the Donbas region and of Crimea. In any case, the Russia is going to win this war for that uh, uh, territory in the Ukraine. Uh, the question is, if Russia is going to keep that anyway, why should we be supporting the Ukraine at the cost of the Ukrainians? It's not going to change the result uh, in the end. So my question to the uh, distinguished presenters here is what should the role of the West be, considering that what we're doing now is leading to greater human suffering, whereas if we were to pressure the Ukraine to give up those territories, uh, that would reduce the ultimate human suffering and allow the rest of the Ukraine to develop more or less normally. So that was my question. It's a moral question here. Slava. A very simple answer, simplistic answer. I don't think we should support, uh, we take for granted that the Russians will take this area of uh, Ukraine, maybe much more than we think. The issue is to get rid of aggression that causes millions of people to uh, lose their home, their existence, and die. And that is, an, that, that is the primary objective, what I would say one has to fight for. Yeah, but how would you uh, uh, have that magic wand uh, shoot? Uh, remove the aggression. <laughs> that will be more difficult to answer. So I would like to hear from Slava to your response. What would your response uh, to Carl's question, to, to Jamie's uh, comment? Slava, you, you, you're muted. Um, uh, as for um, uh, Jamie, comment. Uh, to be honest, uh, I don't know uh, answer. It is uh, very, uh, very difficult uh, question uh, for uh, this uh, situation, but uh, I recognize uh, that it is a very important uh, question. Uh, and uh, uh, at who uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, listening and uh, understanding. Uh, and uh, uh, I um, uh, understand uh, uh, your uh, attitudes uh, or uh, opinions. Uh, I have focused uh, only uh, on uh, one. Um, aspect of the uh, conflict, uh, which uh, is uh, usually uh, unrecognized uh, in the West, uh, but uh, I understand uh, all uh, your uh, attitudes, uh, this uh, attitudes and uh, these aspects are, uh, exist, uh, of course, uh, and uh, uh, in uh, my opinion, uh, we should uh, try to uh, construct uh, full uh, pictures, uh, full picture. Um, and uh, maybe uh, remember uh, Russell Akov uh, method uh, to uh, dissolve uh, this uh, problem. Thank you. The reason why I started so far in the history with the Hanseatic League was that was a good example of how various cities can work together 
exchanging goods that they have not they need from other places, or the whole trading routes, for example, in Europe from salt to India and spices from India to Europe, this can be done. And in fact, I would say the uh, Hanseatic uh, League was at the beginning or was an, an, a, a model of, of the United, uh, United Europe, except that they had no administration and, and allowed themselves to be ultimately eaten up by, by the interest groups it's surrounding it. But it can be done. It can be done by respecting other people, what they have, and trading. Larry, Grant, Lucia, we haven't heard from you guys yet. I think uh, I, I don't have much to add here, but I don't want to, to get lost. How much Ukraine uh, has to offer? Uh, they're one of the leading exports of minerals in the world, one of the leading exporters of, of, of wheat in the world. Uh, this is not trivial. Yeah, it's not trivial in this, in this, in this uh, 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 conflict, I don't think. I don't know what to do about it uh, uh, other than it, it's out there. We, we have to acknowledge that these things in our current world are important to other people. Uh, they're important to those who are trade partners with Ukraine, but there's, it's, it's very important to Russia. And uh, I mean, Russia's had access, uh, they are at least, uh, you know, some of the mining institutions and so forth had access to their at, at quite a large it, price. It, it is like, uh, yeah, that's all you're allowed to have. Mm -hmm. So I, I'll, just, I'll just leave it there. I ask a question. One of the things that uh, strikes me is that the various parties all have a different story and they interpret uh, phenomena in terms of that story and make them into facts. And one of the stories that I like um, to emphasize is that whatever the reasons for Russia to eliminate uh, the Ukraine. The Ukraine has had a taste of independence and of autonomy. Um, I would like to go a little bit back to what Klaas was saying about the history. At a certain moment in time, the Netherlands was part of the Habsburg Empire. And at a certain moment, uh, and including Spain, and at a certain moment, it said, uh, we don't like the way the Spanish are imposing rules and laws on us. So this started the 80, uh, the 80 years war. And I think that if you look at the 80 years war, the major point was that people wanted to be independent and control their own local situation rather than be controlled from far away Spain. So I think I, it, I would like to emphasize a little bit more this notion that the Ukrainians having tasted independence would like to be independent and will fight for it, whatever the reasons of the other uh, countries to uh, prevent that. Exactly. Until someone responds, uh, my quick response would be, uh, I think no one is, is denying that. I, I think what, what we're really here together is to figure out how to make this happening with less bloodshed. Uh, and, and what we can learn from the last um, like 400 years since that 80 year war, what is it that we have learned from the enlightenment that we can put to work to, to reduce um, or to, to make this possible with as little uh, bloodshed 
as possible. And then uh, uh, a subsidiary question is what can the universe, I mean, that's my pet peeve or my hobby question. What can the university do? Or is there maybe something in the university that's actually blocking uh, a productive engagement? And, and if, if, if there is such a blockage, what can we do to remove it? Well, this is what I'm actually, the, my whole idea was people learn if they are willing to. For example, in after the First World War, they realized maybe the monarchs are not a good way of following and got all rid of it. And then they, they invented, one could say, democracy, but it was so naive and inco uh, incompetent in dealing with big economic problems that fascists took it over. And after the Second World War, I think the European nations examined what was wrong and learned from that and changed their constitution, changed their relationship with, with each other. And that is, I think, a, a, pro, a tremendous progress in terms of uh, people living together. And, and obviously it doesn't include everyone. For example, Russia is still, I think hundreds of years ago, the, the attitude, the more, can, uh, more territory, the more important, et cetera, et cetera. That is just very unfortunate. And, and following what I'm always saying, abstractions. That deals also with China. No? Now, why is Taiwan part of China? Because of the idea of, of a unified China. No, that's an idea, it's an abstraction. Why can't we leave these people their lives and other people their lives? There's no need for, for fighting for abstractions or killing for abstractions. Carl? Yes, uh, I'd like to return to what uh, Gerard said about uh, the Ukrainians developing a desire for their independence. And we can't do anything about that. But what we can do is decide to what extent we in the West should support their desire for independence, given the reality of the situation that they're going to lose this war against Russia, no matter what happens. It depends on how long it goes on, but uh, the Ukrainians are, cannot possibly win against Russia and we cannot stop Russia from uh, taking over that portion of the Ukraine because of the risk of nuclear war. We don't want to go to war with Russia. So the moral question for the, us in the West is to what extent should we enable the Ukrainians to destroy themselves by prolonging the war? Uh, I would like to see uh, some of the discussions here deal with that moral issue about what we in the West should do because we are an actor that determines uh, the amount of human suffering that's going on in the Ukraine. Well, I'll jump in on an answer to that because I do think the West, I think it's an important question. I do think the West is a major player. Part of the reason I, when I offered to make a presentation, I wanted to focus on what I think the real issue is, again, competing autonomies. And the, and the dangers with that. And I do think there is bad actions that can be taken and good actions. I think oppressive autonomy as exhibited by Russia in this case uh, is not acceptable. I think good autonomy is independent places, whether it be individuals or families or communities or companies or countries saying, we wanna be in charge of our own affairs. We wanna run our lives the way we want and we're gonna have a set of rules that allow us to do that as long as we don't inappropriately infringe on other people's rights to do their thing. And that has, Bill, let uh, me finish, that has practical consequences, it has moral consequences. And, and I certainly don't think we should just take a pragmatic, they, there, there's no, I would argue, be happy to discuss further whether there's no way that the Ukrainians can win this war. I also think there's reasons that there's no way the Russians are gonna win this war. But the point is, if we don't stop and we and if we don't hold people accountable for inappropriate autonomy and oppression then it's going to happen further and and part of it is that absolutely einstein had a very famous quote and i can't remember the specifics of it now but i saw it the other day and i was going to include it in this talk but basically said that the greatest danger is not the people who are committing the atrocities or the or the it's the people who stand silently by and let them do it we live in a collective world 
we interact with each other, we have responsibilities to ourselves and to the greater good and to other people. And if, if we don't recognize that bad behavior can be infectious, can grow, that there can be all kinds of positive feedback loops that just reinforce increasing authoritarianism, um, then in fact, we have issues. And you know, Larry mentioned obvious stuff. I mean, not obvious, we didn't cover everything, but I would reinforce what Larry said. Ukraine has much to offer. If Ukraine didn't have the level of minerals and the level of grain, it wouldn't attract the level of global attention of people saying, hey, we can't let this happen. But because it is part of the West, because it is trying to be free and build a, a, a reasonable capitalist society, because it has much to offer to the rest of the world in, in, in practical ways, this now has global consequences. And again, if we don't resist the kinds of overt oppression that Russia is engaging in, which is a long history, this is not, they didn't become autocratic just, you know, 100 years ago. And, or whether it be the Maganistas or whether it be the, you know, folks in other parts, in other situations where they're acting in authoritarian ways to take away people's freedoms or constrain their freedoms, then in fact, that will increase. Um, and that's that's the concern I think that that we ought to be addressing. It's not the only concern. It's not the only way to look at it, but I don't think it's trivial. That's a minor point. Uh, uh, and that goes back to the Second World War and the and the United Nations uh, Foundation, in which basically the victors had veto rights, hmm? and that yeah. was the Soviet Union and yeah. China. Now, Russia was not part of it. Russia usurped the right to veto. And I think this is a big mistake to have a United Nations a Security Council, which one member can veto anything that they do uh, to be considered. I'll make a comment here. Uh, Bill, you said that it's unacceptable uh, for Russia to do what it's doing, and I agree with you, morally, it's totally unacceptable. But practically speaking, what does our refusal to accept it actually mean? How are we going to stop them? In other words, we're faced with the reality of the situation. You don't think that uh, Russia is going to win over there, but the reality of the situation is that uh, Russia has already expanded its territory <clears throat> control of, of the eastern Ukraine. And by all uh, reasonable considerations, it's going to continue to keep it. They are simply stronger than the Ukraine, and there's nothing we can do about it. So it is morally unacceptable, but practically, we don't have much choice but to accept it. Uh, the question is, where should we draw the line uh, in, in fighting Russia? Should we continue to do this at the cost of the Ukrainians. It's not at your cost or at the cost of Europe or at the cost of the Americans. Uh, of course, we're spending lots of money to fight the Russians, but it's not a, 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 a physical cost to us in the West, but we are enabling the Ukrainians essentially to destroy themselves without significant prospects of victory and of stopping Russia from taking the Eastern Ukraine and Crimea. And able also the Russians by saying, we can't do anything because you're so strong and you have already captured. And that is the big problem. And remember Czechoslovakia. <clears throat> yep. And remember that this, in this most recent round, and, and Klaus mentioned some of it, so does Slava, you know, this didn't just come out of the blue. They, I mean, some people look at it, it's all of a sudden on their radar screen and, oh my God, why did Russia invade the Ukraine? Ever since the Soviet Union disbanded and Putin got in, there's been increasing trying to regain countries by force or by persuasion, et cetera. And in the case, and I didn't list all the others because uh, this wasn't meant to be a comprehensive thing. It's just looking primarily, you look at Russia, you have the, the build up to the Russia-Georgia war. There's all kinds of tensions and issues going on there. They did the Crimea, they did the Donbass. Afghanistan. Moving. And at some point in time, you say, where's, where's the red line? Which exactly. line? Exactly. Where is the red line? Uh, okay. and, and and now folks are saying, and again, if it's not like I, at least I don't see that it's primarily people in the West holding the gun to the Ukrainians' heads and saying, "You need to fight the Russians. We're going to use you." And you know, they're saying we need help. We ought to do something about this. We have legitimate rights. We have practical rights. We have moral rights. 
And but again, this phenomenon, at least framing it as, as a conflict that not just in historical terms, but looking at the central role of human autonomy and how you balance multidimensional autonomy in terms of freedoms, my freedom to do what I want so that it doesn't interfere with your freedom to do what you want. Okay, that is really fundamental. It's fundamental to human activities on the planet at the global down to the, how do you get along with your neighbor? But it's fundamental from a cybernetic standpoint. And, and I think we need to recognize that. And especially in this case, this is not an anomaly. This is not an isolated event or act, activity just out of the blue. It is part and pattern of a whole pattern that's been increasing over the last 30 years where, where we've been making so much progress in improving human rights and respect for the law and respecting how we coordinate our, our individual freedoms so that it doesn't result in conflict. Again, going Hanseatic League is a very good example of things that have worked in the past without coercion, et cetera. But now it's starting to get more and more rise of authoritarianism in multiple places. All It's breaking out all over the planet. It's not just in certain places. And increasingly violent, increasing imposition of positions, et cetera, especially when there's resources at, at stake. You know, there's an awful lot of this for the rush coming in is because of the, the precise point that, that Larry mentioned in terms of the resources they have, uh, both grain and minerals. So uh, I, I think uh, in if you want to be truly Jerry, sure, no, Jerry uh, can, uh, raised can, the hand for yeah. a long time, Jimmy. No, but I, I just want to respond to that because we, <laughs> we, we need to be cybernetically here. What is missing today is a presentation that uh, discusses the role of the United States and all the things they did to actually make the conflict worse. And, and the aggressive behavior of the United States that kind of makes it difficult for them uh, to take here the moral high ground. And I go back down to Klaus's uh, framework about runaway positive feedback loops. So there are two feedback loops. There is one in Russia, but there's also one in the United States. And, and to get back to what uh, Carl said, He's not just, uh, I think he's also talking in the bigger picture. So if we uh, let uh, the Russia take over the Ukraine, that's not the end of the conversation. No, we still can uh, aid the, uh, Ukraine and Russia uh, to implement democracy. Uh, but, but I think we really need to look at what is the role in the United States and not just say this is a European conflict and we're, we're going to fix it. That, that the United States' own behavior, own militaristic behavior, has kind of added to the problem, and and how we can move forward, putting everything on the table instead of just um, one item. Jerry, go yeah. ahead, please. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. Uh, first of all, I wanted to compliment all of the speakers. Uh, excellent presentations uh, that uh, really are notable and leaves one with a lot of food to think about. So I really appreciate your contributions. Uh, but the, and the, now for the issue of languages comes up in uh, the evolution of the human species over the world. And this language issue is deep and profound and uh, separates peoples. In, in various ways. And uh, so I think that would be one facet of, of this discussion that uh, probably could be strengthened. Uh, but I think the other question I wanted to raise was, uh, okay, so we have feedback loops, we have feed forward loops, we have all sorts of loop-de-loops, uh, we have hula hoops that loop and loop. Uh, so what does this really mean in terms of the present context? and? So I'll raise a question. How much predictive power in our, are these in various views? Uh, where does the predictive power of mathematics and the separation of languages come into existence in this discussion? And I'll phrase this question far more precisely and point to the situation that, that Bill raised with the magnetism which a word he apparently invented uh, for this purpose and, uh, or for other purposes, but used in this context, I suspect. So at the present time in the United States, 
we have feedback loops and forward loops that are in deep conflict. Uh, part of this you can just raise right off as being politics as usual, but I don't think that's the case. I think there are feedback and feed forward loops within the United States today that have the potential to generate deep conflicts. Indeed, in, in a few years, it could generate a civil war. Uh, I think that's unlikely, but I just note that this, the depth of this conflict is there. And the nature of the conflict is certainly poorly understood by the Eastern press and uh, this part. Now, I live in central Minnesota uh, on the banks of the Mississippi River. Uh, the county that I live in is so-called the, the deepest red county in, in the state of Minnesota. 77% uh, of the voters voted for Mr. Trump. Now, many of these voters are my friends, all right? I know them well, they're good people, et cetera, et cetera. They're leaders in the community, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, government officials, et cetera, et cetera. So it's their basic view of where control of lives are coming from. And this uh, is what their objection is to Washington and to much of what's going on in, in, if we would say, the liberal views of the East Coast press. Now, uh, I'm deeply conflicted in this situation myself, but I see these as honest political actions of these people to control their own lives, their fright, their desire to have independence of how their communities operate. And so in this context, uh, the United States has this exceptional structure of where we have local townships. We have several layers of government. Each of these layers of government has separate feedback and feed forward loops. And the effort to integrate these feedback and feed forward loops come through the, if you would, the five levels of government structure, township or cities, counties, states, and federal. So uh, the conflict lies between these different levels of government. The MAGA folks, uh, the Trump supporters, deeply believe they want local control of their, for example, their school system. They want local control of their religious freedom, particularly this is the anti-abortion aspect of it. So these are all very tense factors that have led me to conclude that Mr. Trump is in a certain sense a political genius on the level of Adolf Hitler. Uh, he recognized conflicts, he recognizes how to take over uh, and control his supporters. And in this context, I can ask any of you or all of you to say, where is the United States headed from a cybernetic perspective? Are the positive feed forward loops going to overtake the negative feedback loops or not? <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I'm, well. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to take a stab at that. I just didn't want to jump in again. Um, I think I'm deeply concerned about the positive feed. If you say the pod, if you see the positive feedback loops of different groups just reinforcing their own views, then I'm deeply concerned about that. I think that's um, going to have significant conflicts coming down the road as, as you have <clears throat> artificial intelligence. The, 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 I think the issue is, again, there are a lot of people that might vote for Trump and identify with the concerns about not wanting the government to, to control all of its aspects of its, of its life, but yet they some of them are really very favorably authoritarian, that is in the sense of saying, we're gonna impose these constraints and on other people's freedoms. So as an, and Jerry, you mentioned the abortion issue. There's a huge difference. I know it's, it's very contentious, but to me, it ultimately comes down to questions of autonomy and who's best to make the decision. And if there were laws that compelled people to get abortions, then I would be fighting against those laws. But when you start having laws that compel people or prevent them from exercising their own freedoms in a responsible way, um, simply because they have different beliefs, uh, that's acceptable. 
So, but again, the issue from a cybernetic standpoint is not just the, the positive feedback loops or the negative feedback loops and ones that are correcting and ones that are reinforcing. It's a question of this autonomy and to what extent do we value freedom? Because that's what cyber our cyber <laughs> abilities give us. So in our country, I think what I see right now is a whole lot of positive, negative, positive feedback loops that are reinforcing for different groups, their own particular views, building up the passions. And because of the technologies that are out there, especially the digital technologies, makes it much easier to connect with people. Your community is no longer just on the banks of the Mississippi in rural Minnesota, which is certainly a lovely country, but it can be anybody around the planet if you can reach them in, in the cyberspace. And, and so that's feeding all of that. And so that's my take on it. It's certainly not simple. It's not straightforward. I don't mean to make it that way, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm deeply concerned about what's happening, not only in the United States, but in other countries, many other countries of similar kinds of, of what I would consider to be unproductive and unhealthy behavior for, uh, for folks. Slava, Klaus. Do you have some concluding remarks? Well, I think the, one of the problems is actually autonomy. If you have autonomy and if everyone has autonomy, then we'd have no connection with the others. We need another co concept, namely autonomy, but with respect to other people. Slava. Uh, very short uh, remark. Uh, in uh, my opinion, uh, we uh, should uh, discuss uh, the situation uh, both in terms of uh, feedbacks uh, and uh, in terms of uh, integrities. Uh, maybe uh, this is uh, right path uh, to uh, recognize uh, the whole picture. Thank you. Perhaps we need a, a, another session to continue this. Uh, ideally, Slava, if you invite all of us to Russia, <laughs> we can really see what's going on. <laughs>